Greetings, everyone, YouTube, Reddit, skeptics and believers alike. So, like so many of you, I have been immensely interested in the video that Sam Shortek and uh, Jimmy Chappie released a few weeks ago. I'm not normally the kind of person who publishes YouTube videos. If you can, uh, you can take one look at my Mad Max Wasteland of a channel and figure that one out for yourself. But I, uh, I really believe that we've come across something special here. I was part of something special. And I, uh, I wanted to be a part of that and, you know, contribute however I can. I, uh, I just want to give a huge shout out to Rob Woodis for his, uh, his analysis thus far. Uh, he's kind of the one who inspired me to make this, so thanks, man. I uh, think you've done a really great job. I uh, hope you like this, and I hope everybody does, honestly. I, um, I have a background in computer science, but I also have a rather intense personal interest in theoretical physics to a degree that some might consider borderline unhealthy, <laughs> uh, especially as it pertains to areas of physics that are largely contested or unreconciled, such as the, um, the incompatibility between general relativity and quantum mechanics. I don't believe that nature operates in terms of infinity, and for those of you who are kind of familiar with general relativity, you, uh, you know exactly what I mean when I say that. Um, in the context of empirical physics, I believe that infinity is largely a contrived human construct that civilizations a lot more advanced than ours likely have little or no use for. And before all you mathematician types start getting out your flamethrowers and having fits about things like Cantor and infinite sets, I just want you to please pay careful attention when I say empirical physics. Empirically speaking, I believe that the quantum realm is essentially where the concept of infinity goes to die. So you know, I, I also believe that science and modern civilization have been using Maxwell's equations incorrectly for well over 100 years now. And uh, this is largely to blame for many of the unreconciled aspects of physics that uh, scientists currently struggle with. I, um, I absolutely encourage everyone to learn about the history and the origins of Maxwell's equations um, and how shortly after his death, Maxwell's death, a number of other scientists, uh, most notably Oliver Heaviside, got, hold, got a hold of Maxwell's original equations and unwittingly massacred the unholy bejesus out of them. <laughs> Maxwell's equations were originally 20 quaternion equations, but after Heaviside, Josiah Gibbs, um, and Heinrich Hertz all got their hands on them. Uh, those 20 quaternions got whittled, whittled down to four vectors, four vectors. And they did that primarily because the math was simpler. It was uh, considered by them to be more notationally succinct and easier to understand. So it's kind of a travesty. if if you know the history of it and know what, what happened there. You know, granted, it's, that's, that's a really highly simplified breakdown of events and uh, that debate that happened over vectors and quaternions um, at the you know, beginning of the 20th century, uh, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. But the, the story is invariably the same and has the same ending either way. Um, if there's any theoretical physicists or mathematicians out there listening to this, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that there are very specific rules about how we go about simplifying anything in mathematical terms. And that if we do just one operation incorrectly or neglect to account for a single physical component that binds uh, an equation set to reality, at best, we've tainted the equation set and the underlying theory entirely, and at worst, you know, we fork our conceptual understanding of reality and force ourselves to operate with artificial constraints that nature doesn't demand of us. And I, I really believe that this is exactly what Heaviside did when he discarded the scalar element of Axel's equations. He, 
you know, the, the scalar element is essentially what sets a quaternion apart from a vector. And without it, we've been led to believe over the past century that nature demands that we conserve energy in three dimensions. And this is just existentially false. You know, conservation of energy, to, uh, you know, it applies in four dimensions, um, you know. So hence the scalar component that we're so miserably lacking. You know, there's a, an incredibly smart gentleman out there named Tom Bearden who has done a tremendous amount of work in this area. And for, any, for anyone who's interested, I really highly recommend checking out, you know, his papers and his other works. He has a few books out. Um, I'll link to some of them in the video description. And, uh, yeah, so kind of sorry for going off on a tangent, a tangent, but uh, I really think that it's worthwhile to take a second to let you know where my interest in the subject stems from and quickly touch base on some of the reasons why I think we may not be in such a good place scientifically as we think we are. Um, so besides all the countless times I've read somebody say something like, it's a bird, you know, I've also seen a lot of people dismiss this video on its face solely because, quote unquote, it's impossible for something to travel as fast as this without disturbing the air around it. And that is such an anachronistic, antiquated, early 1900s way of thinking. And it's just, it's just wrong. I mean, it's been postulated since the beginning, you know, it's been postulated for decades now that, you know, how you can perturb and distort or expand and contract space time in just the right way so that it allows for craft like the one captured in this video to travel at arbitrarily large speeds and do so in a way that is entirely compatible with general relativity. Uh, I think I'll put a couple of papers down in the description as well that discusses that in a lot greater detail. Um, so when, when the LIGO interferometers de detected gravitational waves and Caltech made the announcement back in 2015, I really thought that this would be such a huge eye opener um, that extended far beyond academia and, you know, the workshops of professional theorists. Yeah. But as it stands and thus far, I've really been severely unimpressed by just how little people have caught on and uh, how monumental and practically immeasurable the implications of such a discovery really are. I mean, think about this for a second. Gravity is a wave. <laughs> Do you have any idea what that means? All you have to do is flip a light switch or crank up the volume on a stereo, you know, reheat your last night's meatloaf in the microwave or, you know, call somebody on your cell phone to realize just how insane it is to discover that gravity is a wave, you know, just like any other electromagnetic wave. Our, our ability to manipulate electromagnetic waves and the electromagnetic spectrum is practically framed and laid down our basic construct for modern society, you know, and then to find out that gravity is a wave, you know, meaning that the manipulation of gravity is no longer a science fiction fairy tale, but in actuality, a very real, very serious scientific endeavor, man, I don't know what the hell is going on in the world today, but people need to be a lot more excited about this than they currently are. You know, gravity will eventually become something that we manipulate with the flip of a switch, just like a light bulb. And that's almost indescribable, the, the amount of amazement that brings to, to my eyes and to my mind. Um, yeah, so, so when I see somebody say something like, the, you know, like craft, craft like this is impossible or something, I just, I have to shake my head, you know, and put my face in my palm and, you know, I just think to myself, somebody has seriously failed this person 
I don't know, maybe it was their teachers or their parents or, I don't know, maybe quite possibly it was nobody else but themselves. I mean, I guess a lot of times the signals are all there, right smack dab, right in front of us, practically screaming at us. But um, for whatever the reason, we just refuse to listen. And that's kind of the sensation I get from a lot of people. I think we really need to wake up as a, um, as a society and crawl out of the scientific rut we find ourselves in. You know, we're so much more capable as a species. You know, the, the signals are all there. They're right there in front of us. I think we just have to quit refusing to listen to them. Oof, wow. Um, sorry, I didn't really mean to go off the deep end that far. <laughs> so, uh, without any further ado, I think we'll get right to the, to the point of this video. So, I really have four main objectives in making this video. The first is to provide strong evidence that fundamentally discredits the suggestion that this vehicle is either some species of flying animal or some kind of conventional remote controlled or known military aircraft. The second is to address the lack of a visible shadow and explain why this really doesn't matter a whole lot. Number three is to provide evidence that shows that the vehicle actually was occluded uh, by distant ridgeline vegetation at at least one point in time. And the last is to provide a little more speculative but still educated analysis that may help to identify the propulsion mechanism of the vehicle and perhaps in turn limit the possibility that the footage has been contaminated by really, really good CGI. So let's start out by just listing the information that we don't have. Let's get things straight right out the gate. First is the distance of the vehicle from the camera lens at any point in time. There's no denying it. You know, we, we do not know the, the distance that the vehicle was from the camera. Second is the actual dimensions of the vehicle. Some of you may know that the word actual is underlined. The third is the actual speed of the vehicle at any point in time. So it's no denying it. We have none of this information at our disposal. And with that being the case, I mean, what's the point, right? I mean, have we pretty much lost the battle before it's even begun? You know, is there no hope for the rebellion? <laughs> no. <laughs> Bad po. You cost the rebellion its entire bomber fleet. Oh, you're so demoted. There is still plenty of hope. And let's find out why that is by going over all the information that we actually do have. Well, we have technical information about the drone and the camera. We know that the drone was an Inspire 1. The uh, camera attached to the drone was an X5, which has a micro four thirds sensor. Um, the footage it captured was at 1080p at just about 60 frames a second. And we know with absolute certainty that that is a supported resolution and frame rate for this camera. Uh, the third is the, the lens attached to the camera at the time, which we now know with a high degree of certainty after a little bit of uh, reverse engineering and analysis is 25 millimeters. And I, uh, once again, I just need to give a quick shout out to Rob because I was looking for this information and for whatever reason, I was un unable to find it. And uh, Rob was kind enough to provide that information to me. So once again, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, 
The second piece of information is the GPS coordinates of the drone and the position that it started capturing footage. We have that position with an accuracy of six decimal places, which is just around 100 millimeters. So that's, that's pretty darn good. We can definitely make good use of that. The third piece is the horizontal field of view or angle of view of the camera. And it's kind of a derivative piece of information that we can come to if we, you know, use this and some information about the camera and the sensor of the camera. So let's just go over and demonstrate exactly how we know that the, the camera's field of view is 38.5 degrees because we're going to need to rely on that information here a little bit more uh, in just a bit. So let's let's demonstrate this. Okay, so like Rob did in his video, I'm going to use Google Earth to lay some basic groundwork. But the angle of attack, my my method is a little bit different than his. I like I said, you know, we, we have the starting position of the drone, and so that is what I used to base my, my determination of what the drone could see. And uh, yeah, hopefully I've done a pretty good job of um, determining that. And I'm gonna show you, show you why that is. So here in Google Earth, I've marked the starting position of the drone and at first, I just started taking note of various geographical features and points of reference in that first video frame that you can see. And so, you know, there's the mountains there in the background, uh, some more mountains off to the right hand side. And then we have these three hills. Uh, as well as the, uh, the, the, the plane segregation between the foreground and these three hills in the midground. So this is, this is what I used to determine, um, what the drone could see <laughs> and painstakingly, this took a lot of iteration and trial an error, but eventually I got this first person view in Google Earth situated just exactly, just so that if you take a picture, if you take an actual image, an uncropped, unmodified um, image of the first video frame of the drone footage and overlay it, onto uh, the, the uh, view from Google Earth, you basically have an exact replica of what the drone could see. It's basically mirroring what the drone could see in Google Earth. So just let you take a look at that for a minute so you can so you can come to understand that this is an accurate representation of the drone's field of view. And I will, uh, I'll post a link to this file so that anyone can download it and open it in GIMP. And for any, anyone who doesn't know what GIMP is, it's basically just an open source 
version of a program like Photoshop. It's uh, it doesn't cost anything, and it's a pretty robust program. So, if anybody wants to download this file and and see and 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 manipulate it like I am right now, I'll I'll certainly let you do that. <clears throat> so, with this image being being overlaid exactly onto our view from Google Earth. What we can then do is, you know, use some simple geometry and Pythagoras type uh, math to figure out just what exactly the drone's field of view was in terms of degrees. So what I did is I drew a triangle, an isosceles triangle that, um, you know, we can basically use to, uh, we, we have we have all the, all the sides for the triangle, so we can uh, use those known side values to determine what the inner angles are. And the values of this triangle's sides are 18, 56 inches on two, and the third, the short side, is 1237. So that makes the corresponding inner angles uh, about 70 and a half degrees for the first two, and then 38.93 degrees for the uh, this angle here, this angle which is often referred to in trigonometry as, as theta. So that's the representation, the, the symbol representation of theta. Um, and so 38.993 degrees, and we have a confirmation of that figure. There's a, a depth of field slash angle of view calculator out there in the wild. Um, which just so happens to have all the values we need to uh, plug in for this particular camera. If we plug in four thirds on a focal length of 25 millimeters, what we end up with is a horizontal field of view or angle of view of 38.2 degrees. And so given the the, the small disparity between the value that this calculator comes up with and the value that I came up with, I just split the difference. You know, I just drew the line pretty much right down the middle and used 35, or excuse me, 38.5 degrees as the basis for our uh, our field of view um, and the the information that we derive from it. So I'll, uh, I'll post a link to this XCF file, and I'll just throw out my KML, too, which has all these different uh, these points of interest, these um, different locations. And uh, coinciding with each location, if you double click on each one, it'll take you to very uh, specific points, and the important ones are up here at the drone starting point and the FOV. The, these two points, the snapshots that I took of the view for each is the same, but if you double click on it, it'll take you exactly to where the first video frame of the drone And, and the, the image that I could see during that first video frame is located. So essentially that is how we know how the field of view is 38.5 degrees or just a little bit more or less. I'm sure there's some very small, <clears throat> small errors in where I'm 
you know, located in Google Earth and where exactly I'm looking, but for the purposes of our use, this is going to get us close enough to, um, to, to get us where we need. It, it gets us the information that we, we need and it, it does it with an accuracy that is usable and valid. So let's, uh, let's move on. There is just one more piece of information that we actually do have. And arguably, this information is more important than all the rest. In, in truth, it's just as important as all the others, but uh, it's definitely a pivotal piece of information. And that information is the apparent or angular size of the vehicle as it appears in the video frame. There's, there's a lot of people out there and I've run across several of them already who seem to be oblivious to the, to the notion that this information has any use to us, but I will, will be the first one to tell you that this information is, is a gold nugget there's a lot we can do with this. It kind of leads us into just what does this mean? I mean, what good does what good does it do? And you have to think astronomy. Think astronomy. So astronomers use this angular distance, this angular diameter, angular size to describe the, the apparent size of a, usually a celestial object. I mean, that's what astronomers do. They look to the stars. And essentially, all you need in order to measure the angular size or the angular diameter of an object, whether it's in space or, you know, here on the little blue planet, is draw two imaginary lines, uh, one at each end of the object you're measuring. And whatever angle is subtended between those two imaginary lines, that is the angular size, that is the angular diameter of that object. So, In essence, just because we can't determine the actual size, distance, or speed of the vehicle does not mean that we can't, we can't substitute values for uh, d, little d, um, this variable here, and, and use known metrics for uh, flying animals or uh, military drones. <clears throat> and all of this is possible because an object's apparent size or its angular size is directly proportional, directly related to its actual size and distance from an observer. <clears throat> so, this is uh, uh, this is a avenue that we need to explore and not underestimate because we can determine a lot from this. <clears throat> um, when uh, utilizing these these equations, um, typically you'll obtain the angular measure or the angular diameter <clears throat> in radians. Uh, this variable delta uh, is also referred to a lot in trigonometry as theta. Um, and if we want to convert from radians to 
arc seconds, then we have this uh, derivative equation here. <clears throat> Essentially, for those who don't know, an arc second is just a way of uh, subdividing a single degree into 3,600 different pieces, equal in different pieces. So, with with all of this, you know, we we can, you know, use the the angle, of the field of view of the camera, and the angular measure of the object in the video frame to determine great things. And so let's go ahead and, and, and walk through just how great these things are, okay? So <clears throat> this is one of the, one of the video frames from uh, the original footage, frame 6539. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know right offhand what what minute and second that is, or what frame of what minute and what second that is, um, but it is a frame at which the object is pretty much in direct line with the the camera. And at this point, it's pretty much looking at us straight on or head on. It's not veering off to the to the left of the camera yet, and it's not really coming down the mountain here, um, you know, shooting off this direction anymore either. It's pretty much at that point where it's right in the middle. It's looking directly at us. And so th th that's that's a good frame to use because we can avoid um, some ang some perspective distortion. You know, we we if we can help it at all, don't want to include uh, multiple multiple perspectives of the same object when we're measuring. We 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 want we want just one side of it when we're measuring. If we measure it uh, a little bit further, like say towards 65, 62, at this point it's kind of looking at us from the side. We can see some of its side dimension here. And so if we were to use that as a, a basis for this, uh, this line of thinking, this this line of determination, we would be at a slight disadvantage because we're looking at more than one uh, face of the object. So we want to avoid that if at all possible. And this frame gives us just what we need because it's not coming down the mountain anymore and it's not shooting off to the side. It's just at that, that point where it's looking straight at us and we're not getting a, a lot of multiple sides of it at the same time. So essentially what we can do <clears throat> is go in here, GIMP has a, a measurement tool. If we use that measurement tool to just draw a line straight down, we basically, we get a pixel value. And for this particular frame, Get a pixel value of 5.1, and I know it appears that uh, the measurement should be kind of like this, a little bit longer, and include this this surrounding area. But I am very deliberately and explicitly choosing to ignore this darker uh, this darker portion that surrounds the object. And I do so for a very specific reason, and I'll get to that later on. <clears throat> but for now, the pixel value that we get when we measure 
the object in this one frame is 5.1 pixels. And so having that knowledge opens all the doors for us. Since we know what the camera's angle of view is, we can then use this pixel value to determine what percentage of the entire horizontal field of view that this object subtends in this, in this video frame. <clears throat> I've already taken the liberty of doing pretty much all of the math involved here uh, and, and in greater, much greater numbers than I probably needed to. I essentially broke down each individual frame where you can see the object in any significant size or detail. And I measured the, the height of it and the width of it. And uh, I know this might seem like this is the, the height of the object, but it's actually not. I mean, if you, if you go down the, the, the frames a little bit further into it, you know, there's a point at which the object turns off its side and comes back to a level. So in reality, this is the, the width of the object. It's just that in frame 65, 39, it's tilted on its side. <clears throat> so don't want to get confused about what, what the width is and what the height is. So I have all of this data here. But really, the most important one, the one that we're really interested in, is frame 6539. And if we do the math, and there's a, a formula here that shows us what that math is, <clears throat> we basically take the, the pixel value of the width, and we divide it by 1920, which is the total number of pixels that the video frame uh, shows us uh, in, in the horizontal aspect. The 1080p video footage is 1920 from left to right and 1080 from uh, top to bottom. So since we know the horizontal field of view of the, the camera, that's what we'll use as a basis to uh, run these numbers. So we take the pixel value of the object in this, in this frame, we divide it by 1920, and then we multiply that value, <clears throat> excuse me, this value by 38.5, which is the angle of view, horizontal angle of view of the camera. And when we do that, we are able to see what the, the angular measure in degrees of the object is. And if we, we go a little bit deeper and then multiply this, this value in degrees by 3,600, we then are able to see what the the angular size of the object is in arc seconds. In arc seconds. <clears throat> really, either one of these values is just as good as the other. I mean, my for whatever reason, my mind just likes to use numbers that have a little more meat to the left of the decimal point. I don't know what it is. But in this video, I'm going to use the arc second value. It's going to get us the same information and get us to the same result either way. <clears throat> so at this point, things are starting to come together. So let's break this down another level further and see exactly what we've got here. So over here, we see that this equation uh, is kind of like this equation, but not exactly. And really the only difference is that I've rewritten this one uh, so that one, it, uh, it, it calls for an angle delta 
in terms of arc seconds, not radians. And two, it solves for the diameter, excuse me, not the diameter, the, the distance, capital D, distance uh, of an object as opposed to the, uh, the angular size. And I did that because, well, we already know the arc second value of the object. And since we, since we already know that value, we can use it to then determine something that we don't. <clears throat> and what it also does is it locks us into a proportion. It forms this mathematical relationship that makes this of any use to us whatsoever. It is, it is this relationship, this proportionality that means everything. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use this arc second value, insert it here, and then take the known uh, size value of, you know, some object or some flying device or mechanism or, or animal, you know, uh, a bird. <laughs> we're, we're all well aware that people, a lot of people think this is a bird. So I'm going to, uh, to examine that one at length. And so essentially if we use the, the wingspan or even the, uh, the fraction of the wingspan that you could reasonably assert a bird to, to have when it's got its wings tucked, you know, I, 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 I did consider that possibility as well. Um, if you, if you take those size values and insert them into this variable here, what we're left with is only one unknown. And that is the distance from, uh, the camera lens that the object uh, the, the substituted animal or drone or whatever would have to be from the camera lens uh, with an arc second value that we specified. And when we do that, what we can essentially determine is whether or not any particular bird or drone or, or winged entity would even possibly be something that this object could be. You know, if we have a bird, for example, and, you know, the, the wingspan of that bird is, you know, something like 43 inches or you know, four feet. Actually, let's just do this. We've reached that point. Here's what we've got. We've got our two most contested birds. I've, I've heard people mention the Jir Falcon and the Peregrine Falcon more than pretty much any other bird. And what do we know about the Jir Falcon and the Peregrine Falcon? Pretty much everything. So we know the, the wingspan, we know uh, its maximum speed. And knowing its maximum speed is important because what we need to, we, what we need to do is plug all the values into this equation, get the distance the, the, the distance output, and then ask the question, given the maximum speed of what, whatever bird or uh, object we inserted into this, 
this variable, lowercase d, can can that bird or drone or whatever possibly go this distance in the amount of time that uh, that the object goes from frame 6539 to gone completely disappeared out of frame and to the left and another reason i chose frame 6539 besides the fact that it gives us a pretty much head-on view <clears throat> of the object is that it is also exactly 30 frames uh, prior to when the object disappears from sight completely. 6569, frame 6569, is the last frame that you even you know, remotely see the object. And there, so you can barely even see it kind of blends into the cloud cover at that point, but we can use this to establish a time constraint, meaning that since 35, or excuse me, 65.39 to 65.69 is 30 frames, and we're dealing with a frame rate of 60 frames per second we know that the distance or the time value between frame 6539 and 6569 is exactly one half of a second. So whatever, whatever distance value we get after plugging these values in over here, we know that the object substituted over here needs to be able to go this distance in exactly one half of a second. So that's 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 gonna get us exactly where we need to be. This is all that's all the information we need. So let's go over here now because I've got our famous Jira Falcon and Peregrine Falcon. And what we're going to do <clears throat> is essentially get some, get some data points for these two words. Let's do the Jira Falcon first. I think, think it'll set us up for success. Um, the Jira Falcon has a typical wingspan of, or a typical minimum wingspan, and we'll use the minimum wingspan wherever possible because that puts us or puts myself at the most disadvantage. It gives it gives um, our skeptics who believe that this object is a deer falcon or some other bird the, the most benefit from using the, the the lowest value for wingspan that we possibly can so we'll we'll do that we'll give these we'll give the skeptics every inch no pun intended of uh of uh material that we can possibly give them. So 43 inches for the Jira Falcon. <clears throat> and if we go over here and run the numbers for that, 43 inches is about 3.6 feet. Okay. And so the wingspan of the Jira Falcon, the typical male or the small, the smallest typical male deer falcon is about 3.6 feet, <clears throat> and from there, 
we can go ahead and find the maximum airspeed of the Jura Falcon, which is 130 miles an hour in a, in a nose dive, no less, but we'll, we'll just humor and, and, and give the skeptics every, every possible inch that we can give them. So 130 miles an hour, even though it's patently obvious that this object is not in a dive, it's moving across a level plane. Well, we'll just, we'll just let, let that one slide. You know, it puts us at a disadvantage and it, 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 it strengthens our case if we can come out on top, even with this, with this handicap uh, working against us. So that's what we'll do. 130 miles an hour for the Jure Falcon. So what we'll do is take 130 miles an hour and convert that to the number of feet in an hour, which is 686,400. And then we'll take that feet value and break it down into the number of minutes in an hour. And then again, into the number of seconds in a minute. <clears throat> and we got 190.66 feet as a result. But remember, don't forget that we're not dealing with an entire second here. From 65.39 to 65.69, we only have one half of a second. So we need to take this value and then chop it in half. And that gives us 95 and a third and a third feet. So what that essentially means is that in one half of a second, given the maximum possible airspeed of the Jure Falcon, the Jure Falcon can only travel 95.3 feet in a half a second. So all we need to do is go over here to our, our formula, this, this nice little, this nice little cookie cutter formula that I made and plug in the values. Um, and that will tell us the, the maximum number of feet. Yeah, we, we did the math manually here, but uh, the, this, this formula, these two formulas here will do all the, the, the manual labor for us. So all we have to do is plug in the maximum airspeed for the Jure Falcon, 130 miles an hour. And then, uh, let's see, give it the, the wingspan or the, the, di the actual diameter of the Jure Falcon, which is 3.6 feet. And lo and behold, what we're left with is the maximum number of feet that the Jure Falcon can travel in a half a second. It says 116 here. Um, and I know that it said uh, 95 when we did the math manually, but the, the reason why this number is different from that is because I've also accounted for the number of feet that the drone, the drone itself, likely traveled in that same period of time, that same period of half a second. Uh, thanks to the great work that Rob did, we know that the drone was likely traveling in between 28 and 29 miles an hour. So if we take 28.5 miles an hour, turn it into the number of feet in an hour, and then turn that into the number of feet in a single second, 60 divided by 60 is just 3,600 when in respect to the number one. So we'll just 
use that shortcut from now on. The number of second or number of feet in a single second at 28.5 miles an hour is 41.8 feet. But again, remember that we're only dealing with a half a second, so we chop that number in an additional half and we're left with 20.9 feet or rounded up to 21 feet, <clears throat> which is why that modifier of 21 is there. So with that understanding, we now know that given the movement of the drone and the object itself, the maximum distance that we're, you know, able to give the Jira Falcon for a half a second period of time is 116.3 feet. Now, the kicker, the, 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 revol the, the revolutionary or the, the breakthrough concept here is that, you know, this equation will also tell us how far the Jir Falcon needs to be able to travel in 0.5 seconds in order to be a vehicle or the object on Sam and Jimmy's video. And in order to be that object, given the, uh, the, the, the wingspan, the diameter of the Jir Falcon, we know without a shadow of a doubt that the Jira Falcon would need to be able to travel 1,900 feet plus change in order to even remotely be considered something that the object in Sam and Jimmy's video is. So I want you to just sit on this for a minute and, and come to terms with it because there's no room for argument anymore. The, the, the math here is, is not in dispute. It is not refutable. It is not contestable. It is solid trigonomic math that astronomers use every single day of the week. So, yeah, I'm sure you can begin to understand how we can extrapolate this for pretty much any object that flies that we know uh, the, the maximum airspeed and, and dimensions of. And for the sake of argument and variety and, and comprehensiveness, we're going to go ahead and do that. So let's, let's give the the skeptics an additional leg, just a, another leg on top of us, over the top of everything else we've, we've given them already. Let's say that, you know, this Jir Falcon doing a horizontal nosedive at, at, at its maximum airspeed also had its wings tucked. Even though that is a ridiculous thing to suggest, we're going to go ahead and do it because, well, it puts us at an even higher disadvantage. And by showing that with all this disadvantage working against us and coming out on top in spite of it, we, we've, we have separated the wheat from the chaff and, you know, you know, move this, move this discussion and this argument forward. <clears throat> so the reason I have these pictures that kind of look similar in their, in their framing is so that we can take pixel measurements of the wingspan and uh, convert those pixel measurements to the minimum typical wingspan of the respective bird. In the case of in the case of the Jira Falcon, we know that wingspan is 
just about 3.6 feet. Mm -mm. And so given the pixel value of the wingspan, we can convert that pixel value to the number of pixels per inch. Let's go back up here and take the feet value and <clears throat> convert that to inches. 43, so we just did, did the reverse operation of the figure we got originally. It's because my, my memory is that far gone sometimes these days. Uh, what we can do is then take the pixel value and divide that by the number of inches for the minimum typical wingspan of a cheer falcon. And what that gives us is just about 14.4 pixels per inch. For every 14.4 pixels, the, the bird in this image is a single inch. So with, with this with this pixel value, this number of pixels per inch value, we can then kind of subjectively measure what we believe the your falcon would look like the dimensions from one end, you know, from, from left to right, what it would look like with the swings tucked. And so it's uh, subjective, really. It just depends on your, your frame of view. It's going to, the wings are going to stick out a little bit on both sides. So let's just. Oh, that looks that looks that looks decent enough. So what we have is um, 130 pixels. So with that, we can take 130 pixels and divide it by the the pixel value per inch, and with that we get nine inches. <laughs> so. The typical gear falcon with its wings tucked in a flat nose dive. It's going to be around nine inches from one end to the other in terms of wingspan. So let's take that nine inches, leave the, the miles per hour the same because we're generous like that. <clears throat> And uh, let's see, nine inches is three quarters of a foot. Still, no dice. No dice. Essentially, the Jir Falcon, even with its wings tucked, would need to be capable at. at the si at the size we've given this formula would need to be capable of traveling 396 feet plus change in order to f fit the profile of the object in Sam and Jimmy's video. It can't possibly be a Jir Falcon. I don't believe I can overstate this. The ambiguity is now completely absent. We know without a shadow of a doubt that the Jir Falcon is not even remotely possible in this scenario. It cannot possibly be a Jir Falcon. So with that information and with that in mind, let's just put the Jir Falcon to bed. Let's just let it let it rest. So crossing the Jira Falcon off our list, it cannot be the Jira Falcon. From there we go and move on to the Peregrine Falcon. The Peregrine Falcon is a definite contender for the Jira Falcon because one, it is smaller. 
than the Deer, Fal than the Deer Falcon, and it is also quite a bit faster. In fact, almost twice as fast. So we'll we'll just do the same math and and modify it for the dimensions and maximum airspeed of the Peregrine Falcon. <clears throat> the Peregrine Falcon's max airspeed is 242 miles an hour, and the typical wingspan for uh, you know the the, low, the typical lower lower range wingspan is 29 inches. So go ahead and convert 29 inches to feet and we get 2.4 feet, just over 2.4 feet. So we're going to take that back over to our nifty formula here. <clears throat> Plug in 2.4 feet and give, once again, the <clears throat> skeptics every possible inch we can give them by saying that this, this hypothetical peregrine falcon was, was traveling at its maximum nosedive airspeed while moving f flat across the landscape. Okay. <clears throat> What do we get? Still, the, 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 the bird advocates are left wanting. The Deer Falcon traveling 242 miles an hour, <clears throat> only capable of traveling just over 198 feet in half a second. And given the size value we've provided, the Deer, uh, excuse me, the Peregrine Falcon would need to be would need to be capable of traveling over 1,200 feet in order to, to be a plausible candidate for the object in this video. But since we're so generous, since we're so willing to give to the skeptics, let's go ahead and do the same thing for the Peregrine Falcon that we just did for the Jir Falcon. We're going to take the total wingspan, the, the pixel value of the total wingspan, and we're going, going to correlate that with the um, wingspan value in inches. So 29 inches, you take 675 roughly divided by 29, and we get about 23.27 pixels per inch. Let's put that, put that in our pocket for a second. I'm going to go back over here and do like so, just kind of visualize what the, what the Peregrine Falcon would look like with its wings tucked. And that's good enough. Yeah. That's about 120 pixels. We'll go back over here and divide that pixel value, that partial wingspan pixel value by the number of pixels in an inch. We get just over five inches. So we'll take that value and once again, leave the Airspeed the same because we're we're so giving and generous and willing to put all the odds against us, and we'll just change the uh, the diameter. Or excuse me, uh, that's the the value in inches. So we need to take this and uh, turn it into feet. So. There we go. Just about 0.42 feet. And with that input, once again, still we're disappointed. In order to be 
the object in Sam and Joe's video, the Deer Falcon would need to be able to travel 230 feet in a half a second with its wings tucked, traveling its maximum air speed in a horizontal nosedive. It still is not a plausible candidate for the object in this video. So, sorry, sorry, bird lovers. It just, it just isn't so. Even with all the odds stacked against us, you're still 30 feet short. <laughs> so, crossing the Peregrine Falcon off our list. <clears throat> Let's, let's think about what else we could possibly use as a, uh, a candidate here. What, what other, let's see, we, we, you know, we could use another kind of bird. I think we use one more kind of bird and then I have a, a surprise here. <clears throat> um, all right, so I think the last known bird that we'll, that we'll use is the, uh, the Anna's hummingbird. So the, the Anna's hummingbird has um, been described as the fastest bird in the world relative to its size. And it's, it's listed as having a max airspeed of, <clears throat> excuse me, max airspeed of around 50 miles an hour. Uh, and I've actually seen in a couple different places that it's, potentially has a speed of 60 miles an hour. So we'll just go ahead and use 60 um, for the sake of, for the sake of generosity. And so we know that the typical wingspan of an Anna's hummingbird is just around five inches. <clears throat> So we'll just do like the, uh, the other two before us before and, uh, plug them into our nifty formula here, 60 miles an hour and five inches is just about 0.41 feet. So that, that's too easy. Not even close. Anna's hummingbird. 60 miles an hour, it can go 65 feet and a half a second. It would need to be able to go 220 feet and a half a second to be considered a plausible candidate. All right. So crossing the Anning, the Anna's hummingbird off our list. And I think that pretty much does it for birds. There's no faster bird than the peregrine falcon and no faster bird relative to its size than the Anna's hummingbird. So I think we're just going to let the sleeping dogs lie from this point on. The bird argument is what I officially pronounce to be dead. And from here, we can move on to some military drones. This is the uh, X-47B. It's an American military drone. It has a max speed of around 685 miles an hour with a wingspan of just over 62 feet. So they make it, they make it even easier, easier for us since they give us the, the metrics and feet. So let's just go back to our, our nifty formula and give it a 60, 
65, eight miles an hour. And then go down here and give it a, um, what was it? It was 62 feet, right? Yeah. Yep, 62 feet. And lo and behold, <clears throat> a drone that size, given its max airspeed, can only travel 500 feet and change in a half a second. But given the angular diameter of the object that appears in the video frame, we know that that drone, that X-47B, would need to be able to travel 32,800 feet in order to be considered a plausible candidate for the object in Sam and Jimmy's video. Moving right along, X-47, be gone. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll wait, we'll wait just a second for that one. Uh, the next on our list is the SR-72. Hot off the press drone from Lockheed Martin. Uh, where is it? Yeah. Lockheed Martin is kind of elusive about its, its, its speed and its dimensions, but uh, the, the best I can gather is that it's capable of going around 4,500 miles an hour or upwards of Mach 6. And the uh, wingspan, the purported wingspan of the SR-72 is 60 feet. So, two easy values, both already in feet. 45, 67, and 60. Sorry, Charlie. SR-72, capable of traveling 3,300 feet in a half a second given the angular diameter that we have an immutable value for, we know that the SR-72 SR would need to be able to travel almost 32,000 feet in order to be the object that we see in this video. So, I don't know about you, but that, those are pretty much the the hottest drones that I could find, upwards of Mach 6. If you can find a faster drone than that, by all means. There is uh, there is one drone out there. I saw it. It's a DARPA drone. Maybe that was it. Nope. Nope. Falcon drone. There is the Falcon drone. I have not been able to come up with any dimensions for this craft because if my information is correct, I don't believe it's even operational. I could be wrong about that, but uh, At any rate, yeah, so there's an article as of 2016 stating that Lockheed is yet to build such a craft. And it can go up or upwards of Mach 20. 
it uh, has a completely unknown um, uh, width width dimension, and so I don't know if I'm going to be able to entertain this this particular drone. But all I can tell you is that there's no chance of it being this drone either, because it's patently obvious that with a craft like this going Mach 20 at roughly 50 to 100 feet off the ground, it is moving so fast that the, the front edge of this craft it probably would look just like it does in this in this graphic here, lit red hot because there's so much friction. Um, that at 50 to 100 feet off the ground, it would practically scorch the landscape. It will most certainly knock the drone on its face, if not rip it apart. So I'm going to opt to just let that one go, but I'm not too worried about it because <laughs> it would create a sonic boom so loud that it would probably have caused Sam and Jimmy hearing damage when it went by. And as we already know, Sam and Jimmy noticed not a thing when this thing went by. So this is clearly... Just from a practical standpoint, we don't even need to do any math. We, we know from a practical standpoint that this is not even close to being a candidate. So moving on. And then the last uh, winged article, the last winged entity that I, that I came across that I felt was worthy of a, worthy of a minute of fame was this RC jet that this this German gentleman um, goes by the name of Niels Neil Herbrick uh, made an RC jet holds the Guinness World Record for fastest remote controlled jet powered model aircraft and it's capable of going 465 miles an hour that's pretty remarkable. I mean, I don't even know how how the how the guy even keeps track of the thing when it's flying around. I mean, I think he, if if I am interpreting the videos that I saw of him flying it correctly, it kind of looks like he's wearing an HMD. It kind of looks like he's wearing a uh, some kind of uh, heads up or helmet display that allows him to see where he's flying uh, in a in a you know first person. Kind of perspective, um, but barring that, the the jet is painted extremely bright colors and contrasting colors. It's painted a, a starkly different color on the other side, so that when he's looking up, if he has to look up at it while it's flying, he knows which side is up or down. So I had one hell of a time trying to find the dimensions for this, um, and I couldn't end up finding any for the entire craft um, as one singular unit. But what I could find was the uh, kind of turbine jet engine that he uses on the back of it. It's a Biotech 180, runs on kerosene. So I found a picture, kind of, kind of gives us a heads on view of that engine, that, that turbine engine at the back. And so what I did in, in the lack of any legitimate dimensions or wingspan for this, for this RC jet, I simply took the size of this engine, which we definitely do have a known value for, And a value, where was it? There we 
There you go. The Yotec 180 has a diameter of 113 millimeters, which, if my memory serves me correctly, is around 4.45 inches. Or excuse me, 113 divided by the number of millimeters in an inch. Yep. See, my memory it goes in and out. 4.45 inches. And so knowing that we can kind of set up a little kind of laughable correlation, we can line up several of these engines, one beside the other, and then, you know, say that, well, this is 113 millimeters, that's 113 millimeters, that's 113 millimeters, and so on and so on. So we know that for half the width, half the wingspan, just about, of uh, this jet, it's five of these engines lined up side by side. So that gives us 113 times five. Well, 565 millimeters divided by 25.4, given 22.24 inches. So we'll multiply that by two to give us the total wingspan. We have about 44 inches. And in terms of feet, that's about 3.7 feet. So that's what we'll go with. On, based on some sound estimation, using an object of known size in the same frame of reference, we can say that this, this jet is around 3.7 feet in wingspan. And so what we'll do, just like we have a number of times before, is go over here and plug in the, the maximum airspeed, which is 465 miles an hour. and then plug in our value for wingspan. And once again, we're, we're whittling it down to the gems here. This RC jet's capable of traveling 362 feet in half a second, but given its size relative to our immutable angular size of the actual object in the video, we know that this RC jet would need to be able to travel 1950 feet in order to be the object we see in Sam and Jimmy's video. So I don't know where else to go with this from the standpoint of drones or birds or other objects that are conventionally propulsed. Um, there's really nothing else in my eyes to run the numbers against, you know? It's true that given, given the math involved, the smaller the object is um, relative to its speed, given a given a, a a a speed that persists in the face of decreasing diameter that uh, you're more likely to find an object that that is a plausible candidate but um then we have rob's analysis which you know goes to show us with what i consider to be a high degree of of certainty that the object can't be any smaller than a certain size. And I'm forgetting what that size is right off the top of my head. Um, but you can only go so small before you run into another brick wall. 
So, yeah, your, your, I should say that we, the, the community at large, which is interested in figuring out what this object is, is left, is being left with very little of known origin. And it's not a matter of subjectivity, it's a matter of trigonometry. And it's a matter of using objects of known size and distance to determine what it could possibly be and what it, what it possibly can't be. So, I think with that, we'll just move on to the the bottom line of this of this expedition, this little expedition we've gone on. The survey says it's not a bird. Period. It's not a drone. It's not an RC jet. It's not any of these things. We've gone down a list and we've gone one by one through the numbers and the math and we are left with only negatives. So I think, uh, I think it's pretty clear we need to move on and start examining other options or less conventional or I don't know less conventional options, essentially. And I'm going to go into the, the the shadow thing here in just a, just a second. But beyond that, I'm going to get a little bit more what I consider to be real about this and start um, asking some hard questions. So let's let's go ahead and do that now. All right, so at this point, we're moving on to number two, the second primary objective that I listed at the outset, which is the, uh, the shadow argument, the, no, the lack of a visible shadow, essentially. And granted, there isn't anything as concrete or definitive as trigonometry to to tackle this argument, we, we can at least cast a an air of doubt on it. You know, the, my take on this is that essentially there being a lack of a visible shadow really doesn't matter one way or the other. And let's just examine why that is. So we're going to go back into Google Earth and take note of the exact direction that the, the drone was pointed when it first started shooting. And that direction is just, looks like it's just a smidge east of 180 degrees. So probably 178, 177 degrees, something like that. <clears throat> and then we're going to uh, utilize a solar calculator that's, that's managed by uh, NOAA, National Oceanography and uh, Atmospheric. And, you know, I've already plugged in the, the, the fundamentals here. We know that the drone was flying on October 18, 2016. <laughs> it was 11, 19, 22 seconds in the morning to be exact. When it started shooting, and uh, we were dealing in the mountain time zone, and at that point in the year, daylight savings time was in effect. So this gives us a pretty accurate azimuth for the the orientation of the sun at that time, as well as its elevation. <clears throat> we know that the elevation of the sun at that time was roughly 35 
agrees. So you, you stand, you stand on the ground, straight, looking straight ahead, and then tilt your head 35 degrees upward, pointing in the direction of 144 degrees, which is southeast. Yeah, southeast. <laughs> you would have the sun directly in your eyes. So let's take that back over to Google Earth. And then uh, shimmy over to the location that the, the drone was at when it encountered the object, roughly. So thanks to Rob's parallax work, we know pretty darn well what the, the direction of travel or the point of disappearance for the drone would have been had it continued on in its present direction with without end or indefinitely. And that's up here somewhere roughly, um, if I'm remembering the, the lines as they intersected in Rob's video correctly. <clears throat> so at this current location, we're dealing with an orientation that's mm -hmm. Say roughly 95 to 100 degrees, which is east southeast. <clears throat> and so, what we can do with this information is take a look at the, the sun's orientation in relation to the direction the drone was facing. In and also in relation to the direction of, of incidents or the, the, the essentially the, the direction that the object was traveling in relation to the direction the drone was facing. And we can use the, the orientation of the sun and its elevation to get a general idea of where it was if we're using this video frame as a reference point. So <clears throat> if the sun was located at 144 degrees azimuth, then that's roughly 35, 35 maybe, 40 degrees um, um, excuse me clockwise of the uh, the, the drones um, orientation and so the essentially the sun is over off to the left here some or excuse me over off to the right here somewhere and it's sitting at, a, at an elevation of 35 degrees and so we know that <clears throat> for the vegetation at this location, and we'll just we'll just use the actual video frames as a as a reference. It's nothing beats reality, right? Look, part and parcel. There's a there's a shadow or a tree on the ground right there, and it shows us exactly what we've uh, theoretically determined. So the reality matches what we have shown on paper. And so the, the bottom line and the, the, the ultimate point I'm trying to make here with regards to any shadow or lack thereof is that if you take a look at the object and its position as it relates to the position of the sun over off to the right and upwards, you can see that it's going to not only be out of frame and in shining light on the on the object from a 
extreme angle in relation to the the orientation of Sam and Jimmy's drone. It's going to be um, it's going to be casting that shadow at a considerable angle given the elevation of the sun at the time. So you're going to be really hard pressed, even if the I mean even if it were twice as bright out as it appears to be in these these frames you would have a real hard time uh, differentiating a shadow on the floor of this landscape partially because there's a uh, a valley here there's a valley that makes anything in that valley impossible to see from the drone's vantage point but also because any shadow that the object casts uh, due to due to the sunlight is going to be at an extreme angle. It's going to be over here somewhere. It's going to be by the time the drone reaches this position, the shadows are going to be far out of the frame. You won't even be able to see it. Even if it were twice as bright out and the object was twice as big, you probably wouldn't see it. Just because, you know, that, that's just the nature of the beast. That's where the sun was. That's where the object was. That's where the drone was facing. And so uh, there's really no, there's really no weight that we can legitimately give to that argument. It really doesn't matter one way or the other whether you can see a shadow or not. In, in my mind, the fact that there's no shadow makes this footage even more realistic, given the, the, the metrics that we have a, a intimate understanding of now, the, the elevation of the sun and its, its, its azimuth in relation to the direction the drone is facing and everything else. So I don't have any trigonometry for this, unfortunately, but all I can tell you is that the lack of a visible shadow, it matches up with the, the data. It matches up with the, frame, the frames we see in front of our face. And there's nothing unusual about the fact that there is no distinctly visible shadow especially since there's a huge, huge valley here that makes anything within it impossible to see from the drone's vantage point. So I'm just going to, you know, leave that one right there. Uh, you can take it for what you will, but um, that's, that's, my, that's my best stab at that, and hopefully it makes sense. Um, but, you know, everybody's different, and really can't really can't argue with that so from there I'm going to move on to point number three which is the uh, the contention that I that I'm making that there was at least one point during this this footage where the object actually was occluded by the distant ridgeline vegetation and so we're going to go, uh, let's see, over here. Was it this one? No, it was a different one. Uh, let's see. Nope. It was. Yeah, I think it was that one. 65, 27, no, wasn't that one either. Bear with me for a second. Um, okay, I'm going to stop the video for a second and I'll uh, get my act together here. Okay, sorry about that. You know, when you get to be a certain age, you really start to lose control of what your memory wants to do at any given point. But uh, 
what what we can what we can do. Let's see what we have is frame sixty five twenty seven, and this is a little further a little earlier on. The object is still pretty distant and pretty small, and This this contention of mine is is based on the data in comparison. Uh, when when you when you aggregate the 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 data the the width values and graph them, um, you're given a relatively steady steady trend line uh, over time. And the reason why I, I'm fairly certain that this object was occluded, uh, visibly occluded in frame 6527 is because if we open up a couple of adjacent frames, Make sure they're in the right order, which they're not, naturally. So we open up a couple of adjacent frames. And then look at them side by side. We notice something a little unusual. I don't know if you can see that, but what we have is this object changing its aspect ratio over the course of only four or five frames. It's changing that aspect ratio from less than one, less than a value of one width the height to one and a half. And the reason why I'm fairly certain and why I have little hesitation in saying that this, this is an occlusion is because at no other point during this object's visibility you know does it have an aspect ratio of less than one so you know some of you may may take that as oh it's just really far in the distance and that's just what it looks like it is true that we're dealing with a, a severe, you know, we're dealing with a lot less pixels than we'd like to have for this for this shot for this individual frame or for these frames. But you know, if the object was that far away. I don't believe that it would all of a sudden change its aspect ratio within four or five frames. You know, getting bigger in proportion to a size that it was in previous frames is one thing that that makes sense. You know, uh, from Excuse me. From this from this frame here, I would expect the object to continue getting smaller. If we go in reverse, I would expect it to continue getting smaller in both its height and its width. But as we can clearly see, that's not the case. It makes a significant leap. 
from being just as tall as it is wide to you know, um, you know one and a half times tall as it is wide. And if you if you do any kind of statistical analysis or familiar with the processes involved with statistics or or you know trending that that doesn't fit these values do not fit with the rest of this graph so there is something to be had there and although i'm at a pretty remarkable disadvantage just because we're we're limited on pixels and the object does appear to be quite far away at this point. There's really not much else that I can offer in that regard, except to say that there there is a significant value to a statistical trend. And um, this trend here, it doesn't it doesn't line up with what happens in these two frames not, not at all no, no other point do you see this object um, become taller than it is wide so that's just my take on that again it's not trigonometry so you're gonna have to take it for what you will now everybody sees things a little differently but the best I can do is, sh is show you what I what I perceive and and let the community interpret that how they will. So all right, so my last point seeks to address and pontificate a little bit on something a little bit more speculative, but it's still an educated speculation. And what I want to do is, is identify a visual indication that we have that may be able to help us determine what the propulsion mechanism of the craft actually was. I mean, we, we can definitely, if we're to believe that this was actually a vehicle, and I personally, I very much do believe that it was a vehicle, whether piloted or unmanned or what have you, um, that this vehicle was not using conventional propulsion. And, you know, granted there are any number of YouTube videos out there that fake fake these kinds of uh, fake fake these kinds of uh, sightings all the time, but there are there are giveaways, there are certain giveaways, and sometimes it's it's the things that don't make sense. Believe it or not, it's the things that don't make sense that lend credence to the legitimacy of a, a piece of footage. And I'll, I'll explain why that is, okay? We're gonna go back to GIMP here. And we're gonna take a look at one of the frames where the object is just a little bigger. It's gone on its level with the, uh, with the ground below. It's, it's parallel to the ground below. <clears throat> and we're gonna take a little closer look at something here. And I, wanna, I want you to tell me what you notice right now. What do you see? You see a white, a white mass in the middle here, and you see the the surrounding terrain. Uh, hopefully, I, I would like to think I would like to think that somebody else besides me has noticed this already. But here we go. You, you see the white, 
a white mass in the middle, and you see the the terrain, the surrounding landscape uh, at the at the you know outer edges and and the, all the corners and whatnot. But what we see in between those is something very peculiar, incredibly peculiar. In fact, I don't think that this level of peculiarity can be understated. What is this? What is this section? What are these sections that completely surround the vehicle that are darker than the surrounding landscape have have no have no legitimate reason to be both on top, on bottom, and especially the sides of the vehicle. This side of the vehicle is the side where the sun is shining. Does this stick out as even remotely odd to anybody? What is this? And I, I asked myself that and I thought about it. And being the, uh, <laughs> the, the theoretical physicist in the living room, more or less, I got the thinking. I, I am of this. I am of the school that this this object, this vehicle, is using unconventional propulsion, and that mindset allowed me to come to uh, a, a small discovery. Uh, I had a, a small epiphany. I, I asked myself, what could go towards explaining this? this darkened outline that appears all the way around the craft, especially on the side that the sun is shining on. This is really weird. And it dawned on me that there is a little principle in general relativity called gravitational lensing. Gravitational lensing, which is the concept that when you have a, a, um, an object of sufficient mass, typically we're referring to a star or a black hole, that when an observer sits between that massive object and a light source behind it, that massive object will bend the light that passes by the massive object and will bend it around that massive object and make it appear as though that object is directly visible to the observer when it actually isn't. And I thought about this, well, Okay, maybe, maybe if, you know, we've got a vehicle that uses gravitational propulsion and then generates its own gravitational field, maybe perhaps we've got some kind of gravitational lensing. But what would, what would account for the fact that the, the outline here is darker than the surrounding terrain? Once again, we can go right back to general relativity because another characteristic of uh, gravity when it encounters light in a sufficient concentration is that the wavelengths of that light will slow down and they will do what's called a redshift they will slow down as they encounter that, that object of sufficient mass. And when we're talking about uh, an object that's visible 
to our naked eye, that redshift will, I mean, depending on the, the, the wavelength of the light, that redshift will either make the object we're looking at redder or, or darker, um, or a combination thereof. And I, I thought to myself and I asked myself, is there any way, if it was even remotely conceivable or, or possible that this is what we're looking at here, is there any way I could, I could test that just by this little, little itty bitty video frame, you know, all the odds stacked against me. And I think I may have come up with something fairly crude, but still uh, worthy of some, some considerable, um, you know, some considerable thought and uh, examination. And that was to uh, compare the color of this light, which in, in the physical world, in reality, if you were looking at something this color uh, in relation to something of this color, the wavelength of this color would be would be longer, and that, that is my educated assessment of that. Um, so what I did, my, my crude test, was I took another fancy tool in GIMP called the eyedropper, and I just took a sample of the color uh, of the landscape that is in the immediate vicinity surrounding the craft. And I just hit the, the mouse button to uh, pick the color for that area right in, right in this area. And this is that color value. And then what I did, we'll just save that first color value there. <clears throat> and then what I did is I took the eyedropper and then I examined, I picked up the color value for this darkened area outlining the craft. I went back in here and then I uh, got the two side by side and what, what is interesting is that it appears, you know, you can you can assess this however you see fit, but my analysis and my ability, since I can, especially since I can see all the color values on a, on a linear scale right here all at once, this is the, the darker value and this is the first one I took. If you can kind of see that, or, uh, sorry, I guess I had that wrong. This, this one is the, uh, the lighter one. Um, but what we see here are all the color, all the linear color values going down from one to the other. This isn't a really good example. I don't know why. Uh, let me try and get a better one here. Because I was getting I was getting something a little bit better before. Okay, so. There, that's a little better. 
what we see are all the color values decreasing. And they're decreasing in proportion to one another. Now, I don't know about you, but that sure looks a lot to me like a redshift, in a, an apparent redshift of, of wavelength. You know, the, the, there's no apparent red in this in this frame, but I mean, something else you can do just to rudiment, rudiment, rudimentarily get a, a visual of, of redshift is, um, let's see. You can go in here and you can essentially eliminate uh, all the red and blue color values. And it becomes a little easier to see that it's pretty obvious that this wavelength is getting longer and its, it's spectrum is shifting redder. So, I mean, there's really not a whole lot that I have to work with when I'm looking at this little itty bitty video frame and, you know, have nothing else but that to work with. But I find it pretty remarkable that this outline right here just, just so happens to be directly directly related to the color of the, of the immediately surrounding landscape and the fact that it's darker than the surrounding landscape when, if anything, there should be no shadow on this side of the craft at all with the sun shining from over in this direction. Something was seriously wrong in the neighborhood. This outline, I, I don't see how this could possibly be a shadow. If it were a shadow, then it wouldn't be on the side. It wouldn't be on the top of the craft either. I mean, over here, you know, away from the sun, we can kind of see that. But over here, no, -uh. no, there's something, there's something spooky going on at a distance. No, no pun to Einstein intended, but it kind of fits. <laughs> it's it's uh, pretty remarkable. If you want my educated assessment of what's going on here, what's going on in this particular frame. I think we have a gravitational lens effect going on in conjunction with a redshift, which makes the outline of this object appear to be darker than the surrounding landscape. And what that is a representation of is the light bending around this craft from directly behind it. And in the process, <laughs> given its 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 gravitational uh, perturbation of space time, it is shifting the visible wavelengths redder than the the, the landscape directly behind it. It makes sense from a, a purely theoretical physics standpoint. You have to have an open mind to believe, first of all, that a craft like this is even possible, is even, even capable of existing, which general relativity very clearly 
indicates it is. And then with a little bit of, uh, you know, speculation, because again, we're, we're dealing with a very small area to work with here. You, 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 I, I'm hoping a lot of people can kind of see that this makes sense. I really think that we're dealing with a gravitational lens uh, from a craft that uses an opposing gravitational field to uh, propel itself through our atmosphere without disturbing the atmospheric medium, the uh, the air around it, um, you know, which would negate any kind of a sonic boom or a vapor, a vapor cloud, or so. That, that that's. One of the biggest epiphanies I had while analyzing this this footage, and I, I haven't seen anybody mention this, but given my personal interest in this in this topic, it stuck out to me fairly quickly. If it were just a shadow, why in the world would it be directly? facing the sunlight. Riddle me this, Batman. Why is why would a shadow be in this area here? I really want somebody to answer that question. The the answer that I come up with is that it's not a shadow. We're dealing with a gravitational lens. I you know I think we're looking, if you ask me, I think we're looking at a direct visible indication of a gravitational propulsion system in operation. And I think that lends a considerable amount of credence to the authenticity of this footage. Because think about it, if Sam and Jimmy did fake this, they sure knew a hell of a lot about gravitational physics and then had the wherewithal and the skill to implement it in the supposed forgery just just the right way. It, you know, it really doesn't make sense. At a certain point beyond, you just have to, to start stretching your mind because, you know, if you if you confine yourself to this little box eventually, Nothing is going to make sense. I think that's a part of living and growing and then going through life. You know, at, at, at certain junctures, we invariably have to modify our perspectives in order to, to maintain a, a rational, you know, a rational picture of the world around us. And so, yeah, I mean, let's just take that for what you will. I can't control what anybody else thinks or how you think. Hopefully I've, I've given you some, some things to think about. And perhaps, hopefully I've, I've given you a reason to maybe open your mind a little bit and to stretch your your paradigm to the extent where you can start to see phenomenon like this as being very plausible and and very real i i wholeheartedly believe that it is and you know it's in the it's in the scientific literature it's been in the scientific literature for decades for decades so it's not a, not a huge stretch for me at all With that, I just want to touch base really quickly on a couple of CGI counterpoints, a couple of counterpoints to this CGI argument. The authors of the footage have explicitly stated 
and emphatically stated multiple times on the record that their footage is unaltered and genuine. So the traditional principles of witness impeachment apply. In the, in the realm of law, you know, witness impeachment basically says that if you want to invalidate the testimony of a witness, you have to have a legitimate reason for for doing that. You know, this really can't be understated. Unless you have something formidable, considerable or tangible by which to call Sam and Jimmy's testimony into question, I really, truly, honestly think you should just keep it to yourself because it does no good whatsoever for anybody. And, you know, put the shoes on the other feet. You know, if it were you making these claims and if you legitimately believe that this is something that you experienced, you would want somebody to believe you too. So just just know that the, the, the street goes both ways and there's really no reason whatsoever at this point to doubt what Sam and Jimmy have said or none. Finally, any any attempt to replicate existing footage is fundamentally different and easier than creating an original. I'm sorry. I don't know. I know there's been a few people. I've read a couple people that have said, oh, I can recreate this in five minutes. Well, guess what? You had a template, um, uh, essentially a stencil that you could use to trace the the image that you you drew or the the product that you created it, you know freehand drawing is is obviously going to be more arduous and take more skill than using a, a cookie cutter or a uh, you know, a stencil, you know. So when making qualitative judgments, you absolutely have to consider the uh, experience, the, uh, the knowledge and the skill of those who purportedly fabricated it or, or conjured it up. The, the, the puzzle pieces have to fit. And when you when you try and say that Sam and Jimmy just made this footage up and, and hobbled it all together, you know, I don't I really don't think that makes makes sense given all the other data points we have at our disposal. If you consider everything that they've said and uh, you know everything that has happened and the things that they have done to try and and be as forthcoming as they possibly can. Yeah, I I, I don't believe it for for a second. So I just want to take a second to thank Sam and Jimmy for releasing this footage. I uh, I understand where you're coming from, and I you know if it if it had been me, I would have waited too because having been exposed to this, this category of research for quite some time, I know for a fact that there are entities and, and shadowy organizations that span the globe who would rather information like this never see the light of day. And so it, it took courage on your part and I recognize that and I, I truly thank you for doing it. And I think you have done a great service to uh, to those who are interested in, in exposing the subject matter. And um, you, you have you have done a good thing for for everyone. 
by releasing this footage. So that's pretty much all I've got. I'm <laughs> kind of sorry this this video was so long. Um, you know, if there's any rough edges to it, that makes perfect sense because I don't make a practice or a, a habit of releasing videos at all. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a professional videographer or producer by any stretch of the imagination. So I'll just take this opportunity to thank everyone for their time. And uh, I look forward to your rational rebuttals and comments. Uh, and I will see you all out in the ether. This has been the first <laughs> Truth Serum production. And with that, may the truth ever be in your favor. <laughs>